hello everyone a uh, good day to all of you depending upon which part of the world you reside in good morning good afternoon good evening i'm shakti saran a former corporate sector professional and now founder of shaktify a think tank that is focused on powering social and environmental change i also happen to be a senior fellow with not for profit pixar global india it was in 2018 whilst attending a leadership program that i got introduced to systems thinking in in the field of social sciences and and prior to that my my whole notion of systems thinking was with materially complex systems like it systems telecom systems you know so on and so forth and it was then that i had an awakening that gosh i had spent over 5 decades of my life with the value of systems thinking having gone unnoticed <laughs> so so intrigued was i that i decided to enroll myself into a systems thinking uh, certification program at e cornell run by nobody else other than uh, derek and laura cabrera so thank you very much uh, laura and derek uh, you know for accepting my request to be a part of this uh, this webinar and a very warm welcome to you a very warm welcome to everyone you know who's joined us from different parts of the world uh, we honored to have you with us uh, today uh, derek and and laura and i'm just going to you know for those of you who don't know the cabreras well enough uh, derek is an internationally renowned system scientist and a member of the international academy for systems and cybernetic sciences Uh, Derek not only got his doctorate from Cornell University he also serves as a faculty director for the graduate certification program in systems thinking modeling and leadership. Uh, Laura has more than 25 years of research and and teaching experience with the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, uh, the US Department of Health and Human Services and the US Department of Justice. and currently teaches systems thinking and modeling and systems leadership at Cornell University's Institute of Policy Affairs uh, both Laura and Derek a very warm welcome uh, and uh, you know uh, the other thing i want you to know is uh, that they are also co-founders of Cabrera Research Labs and they are both prolific authors <laughs> so thank you for having us yeah we're happy to be here thank you So systems thinking in education was is a key theme of this webinar today and why is it a key theme it's a key theme because it's a major leverage point uh, to deal with many of the wicked problems we face on our planet uh, today but systems thinking degree courses are few and far between and there are challenges with visibility the objective of today's web webinar is to inquire why this is the case and what can be done to make systems thinking or such education more accessible as a next step what we're going to do is we're going to run a short poll uh, this would just give us a pulse of uh, you know who we are in the audience today and also help in gaining perspectives on systems thinking from our audience a uh, post poll we will get into a conversation i will lead that conversation with uh, laura and derek and this will be done in four parts uh, the first part uh, will be you know for us to get a glimpse or an understanding of uh, you know their systems thinking journey uh, the second part would be on dealing on or rather taking stock uh, of systems thinking in the world of education today in the third part we will discuss the role of systems approaches in disciplines like economics medicine and law and finally we will speak on what system shifts are needed to make systems thinking mainstream after our conversation we will have about 20 minutes uh, for q and a although the chat is not disabled if you would like to pose a question to either derek or to laura please make sure to enter it in the q and a box Uh, now let's get started with the polls yeah there's three questions that are going to be uh that are on as part of this poll so the first one is tell us about your background and select any one option it's a single choice do you work with a social service organization do you work with a private sector corporation 
Uh, are you working with the government? Are you an independent professional like a teacher, a healthcare worker, lawyer, writer, artist, a scientist? Are you a student or a householder? Uh, we have 94 people right now on this call, and I would appreciate if we could have uh, people uh, respond to this question. Okay, so I'm moving on to uh, the second question. So anybody need more time on this? Uh, the third, que the second question is: uh, choose, uh, choose an option or options uh, which come closest to your understanding of the term systems thinking. It's multiple choice, so you could the study of the properties of a system, an organism thing, phenomenon, organization as a whole, which none of the parts exhibit, an approach to integration based on the knowledge that component parts of a system will act, the management of complexity, a complex adaptive system, and all of the above. We have 59 respondents so far. We have another three minutes to go. For those of you who are just walking in into the webinar right now, we're conducting a short poll. Uh, there's three questions in the poll. Please uh, take a look at the questions and respond appropriately. Okay, I'm move, going to move on now to the uh, the final question, which is, as, again, a single choice question. Choose one option below, which is closest to your perception of the goals of systems thinking. Identifying more systemic solutions to wicked social problems. The deciphering of patterns that manifest in our world, example, climate change, systemic racism, COVID-19. A method for building consensus, building the leadership potential through the adoption of systems thinking, and all of the above. Uh, 78 respondents. Okay, so we sh are going to now close the poll. We're going to end the poll. All right. I'm going to share the results for... Just very quickly for people to see what the results were. Okay, wonderful.
we will now get started with our main webinar today. Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, the, the registrations that we got for this webinar are from people from across more than 50 countries. So we're just very pleased with the diversity of people from uh, different areas of the globe who are on this uh, uh, on this webinar today. So if you'd like to uh, mention in the chat where you're joining in from, that would be great. Uh, I'm going to get started with uh, my questions for the Cabreras, and this the first part of the the webinar is the conversation is on uh, Derek and Laura's systems thinking journey. So, a question for uh, both of you, uh, Derek and Laura, you've just seen the poll results. Uh, tell us what is systems thinking from the way you understand it, and why does it matter? And can you also tell us what systems thinking is not? Just for us, for all of us, to be clear. Yeah, there's there's a lot of confusion on that actually, and um, and and part of that is that systems thinking is has been around uh, formally for you know seventy years, informally for over you know maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty, or depending on who you ask, twenty five hundred years, all the way back to Lao Tzu or something like that. Um, and but but modern day systems thinking we know a lot more than we used to uh, as as we understand the human mind and how it works and bias and things like that. Uh, modern day systems thinking is really about matching our mental models, getting our mental models more in alignment with the way that real world systems are, you know, behaving or working. And so we, what we've discovered in in the research is that there are really four patterns that our mind is doing all the time and that that nature is doing all the time. And if you use those patterns with greater awareness, you can um, increase the probability that your mental model is gonna be more accurate and a little less biased in, in many cases. And so it's really just the practice of doing these, these four things, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, and if those mental models are in alignment, that means that the solutions, the innovations, the things you're thinking about are going to give you better outcomes because they're more aligned with the reality of the problem. All right. Thank you. So another question, a follow-up question for both of you. You know, you know, both of you have not only dedicated your careers to uh, systems thinking, but also your lives to systems thinking. Uh, tell us more about this. What made you choose not just a career, but a life dedicated to systems thinking? Well, like like many of probably the people on this call, there was a time where I didn't know that there was a thing called systems thinking. I didn't start off as a systems scientist or a systems theorist. Um, I, I started off as a mountain guide and I uh, spent 20 years taking people up and down the mountains of the world. And um, I learned a lot about systems. And uh, when you're in the mountains, you have to you have to understand lots of different types of systems and see them as a system of systems. And so during that process um, of, of wanting to understand, you know, physics and chemistry and biology and psychology and social systems, all these different types of systems that you need to understand in order to succeed and thrive and, and survive in the mountains, um, I really just was interested in systems. And then it, it came a time when I uh, started thinking more deeply about how I might better understand these things and came to understand that there was a field called systems thinking. Uh, long story short, that led to uh, being invited to Cornell and that led to eventually getting my doctorate and, and teaching doctoral students uh, the, the deep you know, understanding of systems thinking. And that led to a, a National Science Foundation grant that wanted to take the DSRP, which uh, is the four patterns of systems thinking and make it more accessible to people. And so that's where Laura and I met. That was um, the moment yeah, when it all started. On the NSF grant. <laughs> and I remember the day pretty clearly. We, I, you know, She said it was the beginning of the grant. We we're on a plane, I think. We're traveling somewhere. Yes. And she said, well, you know, we're going to need to translate this to the general public. So why don't you start by telling me that, you know, in simple terms, what this theory is and, and how, how it works. And so I sketched a little bit of the mathematics of it on a paper. And she said, well, I know exactly what to do. And I said, 
really? Because uh, I don't. <laughs> so works. it's great that you know what to do. And she said, uh, we need to go teach preschoolers and kindergartners and first graders and second graders and sixth graders. And uh, so then we started on yeah. that journey. I mean, you know, it's 20 years later and we've taught and researched the science and practice of systems thinking from pre-K classrooms to PhD classrooms in nonprofits, government agencies, corporations, you know, and the, and then the net net of it is they're all learning the same four skills that underlie systems thinking. They're just learning them in different levels or different types of content. And I would say the most important thing from our research um, is that we, we know that we can teach systems thinking, which means we can learn to be better systems thinkers. We're not just born that way. It's, it's a skill that can be learned and that leads to metacognition or awareness of one's own thinking. Which might sound obvious that we can learn, learn systems thinking, but there was a time, believe it or not, where people thought, oh, you're either, you know, kind of good at this or not. It was kind of a fixed mindset approach and uh, some people are good at it and some people are not. Today, we know much more about the specific things that a person needs to practice to get better at uh, thinking in in more systemic, more complex, more robust, more adaptive ways. Yeah. So you do need to practice. Practice. Right. I'm, uh, I'm going to come back to you, Laura, towards the end of the webinar on uh, your experience with kindergarten children and, uh, you know, elementary school uh, going children. Uh, but I want to just ask you another question before we move to the second part of the webinar. You know, you have, uh, uh, if you go to your website, which is the Cabrera Research Labs, you have this real audacious vision of uh, uh, 8 billion systems thinkers. Just how... Tell us how exactly do you plan to achieve that vision? It's I have just very curious. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, a lot of it is translating and making things accessible to everyone. Um, a lot of it is we don't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> we're always, you know, we're always partnering and affiliating with people, and you know, it's sort of. I mean, how webinars we're, like this, yeah. so getting the word out. We need more that. importantly. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not easy to get 8 billion systems thinkers, but I think what's more sort of profound about why we want to do that, rather than the how, which is obviously yeah. going to be difficult, um, is for a long time, systems thinking was kind of the domain of quote unquote experts and the cutting edge of science. And, and if you think in systems, you realize that if everyone doesn't understand systems thinking, we're not going to really affect anything. Um, so. So the idea that we need a world full of systems thinkers is, is quite a shift from we need to train people at the highest levels of society doing the most difficult things to think in systems. No, we need to train every child, every kid, yes. every adult, every person needs to think in systems because the world exists in systems. And so it's it's just really clear that we must do this. Now, how we do it, you know, it, it, it's challenging and, and we're just going to keep trying. Yeah, for sure. That's a really fantastic vision that you have, something which I'm, I'm sure we will keep tending towards. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's the direction which we are, you know, sort of headed to. And, and this webinar is a, is a small, tiny contribution to, you know, to that, uh, that journey. So, Reality will be a forcing function there. Yes, it will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, great. So I'm going to move on to the second part of, uh, you know, the, the webinar, which is taking stock of systems thinking in the world of education today. And uh, I know I saw a comment right just as we began in, in, in the chat that systems thinking was much more than degrees, much, much more than college and university degrees. But uh, I'm going to come back to that a little later. But firstly, for the benefit of our audience and in your view, is systems thinking, is it a method? Is it a theory? Is it a discipline? Or is it a way of life? What is it, or is it all of them? Uh, can you just throw light on that? What, you know, before we get into, uh, into systems thinking and education? Yeah. Yeah, so th that's a, a nuanced question. So I, I think in the past, 
a systems thinking has been thought of as as mostly methods or frameworks of various kinds and there were different tribalisms of which framework you're a part of or which method that you uh you know were trained in or and that type of thing but i don't think of systems thinking as a method or a framework systems thinking is a deep understanding or an awareness a metacognition if you the scientific term is metacognition an awareness of the way nature works and the way in patterns and the way your mind works in patterns and how we can kind of get those as close to an alignment as possible. They're, they're never going to be in perfect alignment, but to try to get them in, in, in better alignment. Um, and so systems thinking is, is an awareness of how we think and in such a way that you can make it more in alignment with reality. And, and there are real empirical uh, realities to the way we think, and there are real empirical realities to the way nature is structured. Right. And, um, and so in that sense, it's not really a framework any more than gravity is a framework or, you know, anything like that. You, Definitely. you don't get to choose whether you're using these thinking patterns. What you get to choose is whether you're aware of them. Yes. Uh, all right. So I'm going to ask you a question. It's uh, the scene in India here today is that we have over 100 institutions, academic institutions that offer degrees in systems engineering, but barely one or two that have a credible offering in systems thinking. Can you help us understand, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this would also be the the case in the US though in, in different degrees, not the, the same degree that it is that we see here in India. Uh, but why is this the case? And what is the relation between the relationship between systems thinking and systems engineering? Yeah, can you help, can you help us just clarify that? Um, well, there's a couple parts to that yeah. question, right? Uh, do you wanna talk about the relationship between engineering and systems thinking? I can talk about what we do here. So yeah, why don't you start with that? Well, so I mean, if you think about it, you know, systems thinking at this point is not, um, it's not embedded or integrated into curricula at any large scale, K to 12 or above in the US at least. And one of our frustrations is that any kind of thinking course lands as sort of a standalone class in high school, like critical thinking, design thinking. They even have these courses called life skills, which are really emotional intelligence. Um, and, you know, what we have always been saying and we've been really working on and testing is how to actually embed systems thinking inside of all, all of the existing sort of course content from pre-K all the way up so that it's like a, a tool or a backpack that a student can take with them in anything that we're teaching them and that and that they are learning. So, you know, what we want to try to get to is students having that sort of ability with knowledge of understanding how they're understanding things. And that is the most useful tool that we could teach them at any point in their educational career, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, what, what Laura's saying is, is super important because it's a, a radical shift to the way we teach thinking yeah. and systems thinking. Yeah, the classic kind of thinking is like, oh, sophomore year, we'll teach them a critical thinking course. Well, A, sophomore year is a little late. It's late. And B, you, thinking is the thing that you use to understand, right? So, so it should go alongside the content. It's not there's content and then there's thinking and like, like we just need a little bit of this. We need thinking throughout and in, totally integrated throughout the coverage curriculum um, and, and so if we don't do that, if we don't get away from what students are learning is based on what the teacher is covering, which is a, a very flawed notion. Um, and, and in order to make a class more advanced, we just increase the amount of information, especially in an age where information is effectively, you know, cheap, yeah, right? Uh, everywhere. really what matters is the thinking. So what we did in schools is, is we, we put thinking in parallel with the learning of content. We didn't set it aside as a separate class in a separate year, uh, but it was constant alongside the um, content. Yeah, and the only thing I wanna just add, is you said information is cheap, there, but remember also misinformation <laughs> is really also cheap. plentiful. And so we need to develop that ability to 
challenge how things are presented to us to be more thoughtful about information as it's coming into us and using our own methods of getting feedback against the real world to test the veracity or the validity mm. of what's being presented. Because, I mean, we've seen this in the last six years a lot, right? That that's a huge problem, at least everywhere. And then on the <laughs> on the systems engineering question, which is uh, very related, but, but obviously different, um, we work a lot with systems engineering departments around the around the country and around the world. Um, and you know, systems engineering is a fantastic thing. But we need more of it. There is again this um, content tyranny, what I call content tyranny. That the the content has it runs tyrannical over the curriculum, and we think of systems engineering as just sort of like a bunch of different types of engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, and, and you can kind of have broad knowledge across all of those. And then you get a little bit of like systems concepts laid on top of that. But really, fundamentally, systems engineering is your, your, your understanding at a deep level systems thinking and then applying it to engineering problems, all of which are systems to begin with, most of which are socio-technical systems. So uh, it's very rare that you have just a technical system or just a, a social system or just a whatever system. So it's very interdisciplinary to begin with. And, and so what we need is to increase the thinking part, the thinking skill of engineers to make them systems engineers. Um, and that is, frankly, across the board, quite a weak component of systems engineering programs. Hmm. Although they're more getting more and more aware of this and, and getting more and more focused on it. So what you're saying is that uh, systems thinking needs to be a part of the DNA of, uh, you know, all the all the courses or degree programs or you know whatever that universities and colleges offer uh, but i heard you saying laura that that is uh, even in the us that is not the case so can you can you share with us uh, you know why is why is it that systems thinking has not captured the imagination of colleges and universities not just in the us but but the world over that's interesting. I mean, I think one of the things that we talk a lot about is just the term systems thinking yeah. is is sometimes problematic and seen as a little more um, academic and specialized than it actually is. So it's almost a misnomer. I also think that, um, you know, at least here, you know, what, what Derek was talking about is, is we have this really false mental model of what education is, which is content, 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 regurgitate it, regurgitate it, regurgitate it. And I do think though, for us at least recently, we're seeing that 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 systems thinking is becoming more popular and has more promise and that we want those things to sort of increase um, by really changing the way people think about systems thinking as a concept. I know, I'll never forget a, just a quick story. I, I had a teacher uh, who we, we had trained come up to me uh, at a, a second training and, and she said, um, I love the systems thinking stuff. I use it on Wednesdays in math, but not on Fridays with English. <laughs> and I said, if you just change that sentence to like replace it with thinking, then, then the sentence is, I use thinking on Wednesdays in math, but not on Fridays in English. <laughs> we got to change that. We, we got to use thinking all the time. <laughs> thinking is the process that we use to convert information into meaning. And so thinking should be in parallel. It should be a parallel curriculum to the curriculum. It shouldn't be this like addendum or, uh, you know, uh, supplement. It should be in parallel to everything that children are learning. So they're thinking all the time about whatever it is that they're learning it does and it doesn't matter what they're what they're learning because there's so many remarkable things that we could that we can learn that are so interesting that uh and so that brings into account not just formal learning but yeah. but informal learning i personally as a doctoral student studied um nonlinear dynamics and and, a, and evolutionary theory and i worked under a great evolutionary biologist and i was reading darwin's um uh, notebooks 
his his kind of behind the scenes notebooks and there was a statement that he made and darwin's theory is one of the most important you know theories that we've ever known or in science and he said he said these words these are uh, this this changed my life i still today get chills when i am about to say it in his notebook he said those who understand my ideas meaning those who understand the profundity of evolutionary theory will turn their gaze to education. And he meant formal and informal education. He, he meant it just like in the, he meant human learning. That's a big statement. What he's saying is, you know, I'm Darwin. I know what's really going on biologically in the world. And the way to make change in the world is education. And, and we, we forget that. Uh, it really is where we should be focused. Well, and if you think about 8 billion as a vision, the best way to start is in preschools. Every student in every school, that's how we're gonna get that number to grow quickly is to start in schools and at a young age, because I will tell you, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, they can get this so fast. It's so natural to them because they haven't been trained out of it. And what we're teaching preschoolers yep. is literally the same thing that we're teaching some of the top executives and scientists in the world and, and athletes and everything. We're teaching them the exact same thing. Yeah, There's no true. difference between what we're teaching them. Right, right. But, but you know, so I, what you just said resonates really very well. It's very, very clear to me at least. But, but I haven't still got the answer from you. Why is it that, uh, you know, colleges and universities haven't bought into this idea? Is it because they are heavily invested into reductionist science? Uh, can you tell us why this... Why is it that the uh, that systems approaches have not found their way into academia? I think it's a it's not there's not one answer. It's a web of causality. It has a lot. It has a lot to do with a lot of things. I can start with the field itself. Just, just briefly, uh, if yeah. you can press in, in summary, why why do you think what are one of the top two reasons why we we haven't seen that kind of progress? Well, two two the two reasons I would say is one or maybe three. Uh, one, the field of systems thinking itself has been very convoluted and, and is not, has not focused enough on making ideas accessible and tangible and translatable to everyday people, everyday life. Um, and so that's the first thing. And it, it, for 70 years, it's done a lot of tribal infighting rather than looking for sort of universal patterns that, that underlie all the different tribes of systems thinking. Um, so that's the first thing we can we can get better at helping people get an understanding of systems thinking quickly and practice it. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, Ian McGilchrist just wrote a great book, uh, and he actually talks about uh, just the neuro the neuroscience and the cognition and all those kind of a, and philosophy and a bunch of different fields. But that that we kind of are left brain dominated, right? Uh, and and we need to be not right brain dominated because systems thinking it's it's wrong to say that systems thinking is pro holist and anti reductionist. It's pro both. It's pro doing both. We want left and right brain work together. But according to McGilchrist, he's saying, which I think there's good evidence for. Um, that most of society for most of time has been kind of left brain dominant and, and has neglected the right brain stuff. Um, and, uh, and probably the third thing is just the increase in complexity that results when we get more interconnected societies. Yeah. That third thing is probably having the biggest effect on pushing people there sometimes against their will uh, to say, hey, you better you better start thinking in systems, or you're not going to be able to deal with the realities that we're facing and and that you're facing on a daily basis. So, in a weird sort of way, all that all this new interconnectivity is is helping push us towards a more systemic view. All right, terrific. Thank you very much for that clarity for those insights. I'm going to move to the third part of uh, our conversation, which is the role of systems approaches in disciplines like uh, economics, medicine, and law. Uh, we'll try and cover at least two, and if we have the time, we'll also do the third one. Uh, so let's just start with the discipline of economics. Yeah, so the very word economics is uh, the source, the root word of economics is from the Greek word oikos, which uh, stands for, which means 
our house, our family, our planet. Yeah, in other words, it's our planet. But that also happens to be the root word of, uh, you know, the discipline of ecology. But what we see right now is in our academic institutions, uh, both economics and ecology are so divorced, despite being two sides of the same coin. And you have economists who don't know the very basics of ecology and, you know, vice versa. So what systems approaches can we use to bring them together? Uh, you know, so that's, I'd just love to hear both of you, you know, share your thoughts on this. Yeah. Well, I'll just start with sort of where we're situated now. You know, right now we're teaching uh, graduate students in a public, uh, public policy, public affairs program. And they're from all over the world and they all come with, uh, from different backgrounds, different disciplines, but they all are coming with some sort of presenting problem. And one of the things that we really talk about is that, you know, if, if systems thinking or DSRP are the underlying structures of your mental models, this is true regardless of the discipline or the training you come from. And what systems thinking also tells us that we need to look for the relationships across disciplines and move towards that greater interdisciplinarity because it's how the knowledge of the world actually exists, right? In other words, as you were saying, like an economic problem is often also a social or a political or an ecological program, a problem. And right. what that really means is we need to recognize that the problems we see are not respecting these disciplinary boundaries. That means neither will the solutions, right? Which means that our thinking must match the complexity of the problems we face. And that's what a lot of our work and research in our program is about. And that's really what DSRP does. It aligns that complexity of our mental models with the complexity of the real world, which means we're training our students to see those webs of causality, to innovate more, um, to find new approaches to these sort of, and you know, they come with these seemingly intractable, massive problems, uh, you know, economic, political, social, whatever. I mean, they come from all over. And, and I think that getting them to sort of see those boundaries as artificial has really helped in their work. I mean, how would you yeah, I would just piggyback on that, that, uh, you know, the we, I think we all are aware of the famous uh, biblical story of the Tower of Babel, yeah. where, you know, God sort of spites the fact that they're working together to build to the heavens and, and makes it so they can't understand each other. And, and to a large extent, that's where our disciplines are today, is they, they speak in languages that can't be understood. And what DSRP does distinctions, DSRP stands for dis four patterns of thinking that mix and match uh, that make up the way we think. So it's D is for distinctions, identity, other distinctions. S is for systems, which are part whole. R is for relationships, action, reaction, relationships. And P is for perspectives, point and view perspectives. And we mix and match those um, and what that what that does is it gives us a language, it gives us a, a, a structure to speak across the disciplines, to be truly inter or even transdisciplinary mm -hmm. um, so that we can solve these problems. Like Laura said, like problems don't you, you don't have a problem that shows up and goes, I'm just an economic problem. You know, I'm just going to stay That's in the confines of economics. <laughs> that just doesn't That's happen in, in real life. So. DSRP kind of gives you that, that ability to speak across the disciplines and not just academic disciplines, disciplines of, of just practice, disciplines of, of being human in different worlds and different expertises. Well, and I think that's what you're talking about with reality is going to be a forcing function. We're not going to have a choice yeah. <laughs> but to start thinking differently because things are presenting in such a different way, um, in such a sort of multifaceted way. So. And can we can we apply DSRP to let's say to medicine and to law? Yeah, can you give give us examples of uh, yeah, or is has there been any part of your research where you've tried to take these uh, this this thinking into into these disciplines? Just as and and, and to substantiate. So if you just look at Western medicine today, it is so super specialized. And it's unidirectionally focused on tackling symptoms, yes, to the exclusion of root causes, which might lie in our environment, not even in our body. So how do, how can we look at DSRP and you know apply to other you know other disciplines like medicine and law? Something that can you please share your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, yeah at, a, at a deep level. So if you take law, for example, and then I'll do medicine, but the, at a deep level, law, for example, is based on a, a, a thing called bivalent logic, right? Which is means that you have kind of basically two options in whatever you're, you're doing. So guilty, not guilty, that type of thing. Um, what DSRP does is it makes it, it allows you multivalent logic and nature and systems is based on multivalent logic, which means there's more than two options, right? Things can be gray, things can be ambiguous and, and things like that. Um, and so yeah, we've had doctoral students that have gotten PhDs in, in law, law and, uh, and applied DSRP to the law. Um, on the other side, medicine, for example, medicine's based really largely, not entirely, but really on X causes Y, super linear, decontextualized causality. Well, we know that there is no there's no single causality anywhere in the universe. Everything is a web of causality. So we could we could get more expansive about how what are the webs of things that lead to this, right? So uh, when you get some kind of diagnosis, what are all the things that the web of things that leads to that diagnosis? And we could be more proactive in our medicine about seeing webs of causality, webs of relationships rather than single causal relationships or even root causal relationships. They're really, nature doesn't work that way. Nature works in webs of relationships, not, yeah. you know, this causes this and that's all there is to it. We actually have a recent graduate from our own certification program at our lab who started her, a, a nonprofit in the area of health for precisely this, to integrate across the different types of medicine and change the perspective that we're taking on our own wellness. And it's it's pretty fascinating to see what she's doing in her work. But but I, I do wanna say one more thing, if, if that's okay. Um, I think it's really critical that you, you asked about why is it that it hasn't taken form? And even this conversation is pretty up there in the clouds, right? And, and that, it makes sense for this webinar, but we have to, get people to understand you can understand the basic ideas of systems thinking in five minutes or you know maybe an hour but you're never going to get good at systems thinking until you practice it it's just like the violin or the piano or or you know uh you know jujitsu or any other practice and so a lot of what we've done is translate this these kinds of ideas into what we call moves like you know like you do a move in the gym or something like that right exercises that you can practice and you can train your brain to get good at these things. And, and so it really isn't about understanding a lot of ideas. It's really about practicing a bunch of moves. And that's really how you're going to get good at actually doing systems thinking. And we know what those moves are from the research. Yeah. Fantastic. A web of, ga uh, of causality and, uh, this whole thing you said about uh, you, you know about practice yeah i can't wait to see this getting more pervasive yeah fantastic yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm going to move to you know the last section of our webinar which has got to do with the systems shifts needed to uh, make systems thinking uh, you know mainstream uh, and i'm going to begin with you laura here because you've worked with kindergarten children you've you've worked with elementary school children uh, and you've touched upon it at the beginning of this webinar. So what is it that we need to do with uh, with children, you know, from kindergarten upwards, high school students? How can we make our children, uh, you know, more receptive to a systems way of life? Uh, that's a great question. So, I mean, to us, and we've seen it literally in the classroom at the micro level, you know, it's in those every teachable moment where we're encouraging children at whatever age to be reflective on how they came to understand what they've just understood. And we know now um, that we have a language for that, right? And, you know, if if a kindergartner can know the word Snuffleupagus, which is a character in a cartoon, they can understand distinction, system, relationship, and perspective, or any of the synonyms of that. So what we do is we quite simply teach them these four simple rules in whatever language works for them and have them applied in their everyday work. For example, a small child is making a distinction between colors when they're learning their colors, right? They're making relationships between the states of matter. And it's just a matter of bringing those thinking structures 
that thinking process to the forefront so that they're being made aware, having that awareness of their own thinking. And the one thing I would say, I think there are a couple of things we have to push up against. One is kids and actually some, some grownups really think of thinking just happening in the brain like your heart beats, right? They don't realize, people don't realize they have agency over their own thought processes and they have an ability to be completely aware of how they're building, building mental models. And if you think about, and we've seen this with our own children, all the students we've worked with, <laughs> if you hand a, a child an understanding of the process by which they're understanding anything they're thinking about, then they can take that to anything, meaning they can have both near transfer and far transfer. They can transfer what they learned, those four skills inside of any topic and understand it deeply. And they can also take those four skills and use it to understand other topics that are further away, right? And so it really is, in our opinion, and it's sort of the thing that started getting us up every morning 25 <laughs> years ago, it is possible. It is possible for anyone to learn this. It's actually strangely easier for younger kids because around third grade, their sort of natural tendencies to be systems thinkers start getting beaten out of them through testing and content tiering and all of those things. So I believe the hope of the 8 billion starts in preschool everywhere, but that's just sort of my pie in the sky. Happy dream, right? Is that we get every preschooler to start learning this. I'm sorry if that didn't answer your question. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's great. That's a, that's a terrific answer. It also shows us the way in which uh, how we can make uh, systems thinking, you know, f you know, far much more, uh, you know, widespread. Yes. Yeah? So, so, so thank you. Thank you for that insight. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move, uh, move on quickly. I have two more questions for, for both of you. Uh, so the next question is really on uh, coming back to universities and colleges. Yeah. Are they the right environment for teaching systems thinking? Yeah. Are we barking up the wrong tree? Uh, because a university that is not founded on systems principles, you know, can they really truly imbibe systems thinking? Yes. Yeah. Every place is the right That's place to teach say. systems thinking. <laughs> Every uh, place is the right environment. And, and you know, it, sometimes I, I ask folks, you know, why do I say that? You know, why should you teach systems thinking? Is it because Dr. Derek Cabrera at Cornell says it? Or is it, you know, because, you know, why should we? Well, it's not because of any of that. Right. It's because reality, nature, works in systems. That's the only reason that we should be teaching systems thinking. It's because reality works in systems. So if you don't think in systems, in systemic ways, then you're gonna be wrong a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really that simple. It's not because it's like popular or cool or you know some expert tells you to do it or none of that matters. What matters is that we have to get better at reality to save the planet, to save, you know, to bring people up in the world, to make better, you know, better social systems, to make better technical systems that don't have all these unintended consequences. And, you know, to do all those things, which we're going to need increasingly to do, we must think systemically. Yeah. That's why it has to happen everywhere. And that's why it has to happen for 8 billion people, not the 1%. Yes. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. I have one final question for, for both of you, and I'd love to have a, a take from both of you on this. So you said during the webinar more than once that systems thinking is about sharpening our mental models. Uh, however, at least here in the East, it's seen as an offshoot of Western science. Yeah. You know, while uh, Eastern ancient uh, wisdom focuses on inner well-being and Many meditative practices today enhance the quality of our observation and perception. Isn't there a relationship between the two? And at what stage will Western science be receptive uh, to make Eastern perspectives mainstream? That's a, That's a great question. question. And I think, I think this is the crux of systems thinking. I think it, it is, there is a very, very, very popular misnomer out there that systems thinking is about holism. That is absolutely false. Systems thinking is not about holism. Systems thinking is about holism and 
reductionism. It's about the whole and the parts. It's it's and both thinking. It's the middle way thinking. And the middle way, literally, the Tao translates as the middle way. And I believe that the very first systems thinker was Lao Tzu, who wrote the Tao Te Ching. And what he described, actually, in Yin and Yang, is is what we today, we scientists call at the highest level, we call those coupled oscillators. Yin and yang is just a coupled oscillator, right? So he described that 2,500 years ago, and it's still a fantastic representation of virtually all the things in nature that occur. So uh, I, I think that systems thinking is the, the bringing together of left and right hemispheres of the brain, it's the bringing together of East and Western thought styles. It is, it's the bringing together, not the, not the constant pendulum of we've had enough of this, so let's do more of this. And we've had enough of that now, so let's do more of this. It's, it's the middle way. Systems thinking is the middle way. Always. That's true. That's true. It's the genius of and both rather than the tyranny of either or. All right. Terrific. Laura, your take on this? I mean, all of that. Plus, I mean, I, I mean, maybe I could do this in a story, a quick story. So we have, you know, worked with all kinds of youth and, and different groups of people. And one of the things that struck me the most is we had the opportunity to work um, in a program for adjudicated youth, meaning um, kids who had gotten in trouble with the law and were put in a separate school to be taught um, their course content, but also to be in ongoing therapy. For, to reflect on themselves and their behavior. And there was one day where we got a letter from a student in one of those programs that made us both kind of tear up and cry, which was, he said, I've been using DSRP systems thinking and my biology, my biology grades have gone up, my math grades have gone up. He said, but most importantly, when I was talking to my therapist, I was able to reflect on my own personal choices, my behaviors and who I am as a human to understand myself differently. And now I feel like I can go back out into the world and I will be a positive force in this world, not a person who is victimizing people. And to us, that was it. We're like, and he actually, the punchline of that is he actually asked in his, he asked us, is that okay? That I did that. <laughs> that I did that, that I had this far transfer, that I learned something in biology right. and, and used it in personal development. Is that okay? It was, it was that, it was just one of those moments for us where we, we felt very um, hopeful. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for that heartwarming story. So uh, I'm going to move on to the Q&A section. And uh, I think that I can see many, I can see that, that the chat has been very vibrant. Uh, and uh, uh, we are very thankful to have Christian Sprague today with us. Uh, he is uh, uh, an associate of both uh, Derek and Laura Cabrera and uh, a doctorate from Cornell University. Christian, thank you so much for uh, assisting us with the Q&A uh, today. So I'm going to hand this over to you and I'm going to come in like three to four minutes before the end of our webinar to do a quick summary of uh, you know, some of the key uh, observations and the key learnings from today's webinar. Uh, till then, I'm going to hand over the floor to you, Christian. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thanks for that great conversation. Um, so I'm looking through the Q&A, Derek, Laura, and I'm seeing a lot of questions around demonstrating a move and what you mean ah. by DLP moves. And if you would demonstrate or show what you mean by, by that. Great question. And that, that is, that, that's the question that I hope people take away from, from all of this is, is that there are demonstrable moves that you can make. So. I'll give you an example. There, there are hundreds of different moves, even thousands, but hundreds that we sort of uh, play with. Uh, but there's the research really tells us that five moves get you the biggest bang for your buck, right? By just five moves. Um, and so I'll share with you those five moves. One is uh, what are you seeing and not seeing? You know, so the move is look at what you're taking in and, and also include that you're that what are you not seeing another one is what are how are how are the parts how are the things that you're looking at grouped right and could be could they be grouped differently um so it's a it's like 
how are how are we organizing them as groups? That's the S. So distinction systems, then relationships. How are things related? And so the move is going from no relationships to putting some relationships in. One of the ones that's very uh, difficult to to see, but is super basic uh, and super powerful, we call RDS, and that's relationship distinction system. So you take a relationship. And then you distinguish that relationship and then you zoom into that and make parts, make it a part whole system. And the reason that's so important is because, and this should blow your mind, <laughs> every relationship in the universe is a part whole system, but we just treat it like a line when we're mapping. We just go, this thing's related to this thing. It's just a line, but it's not just a line. In reality, it's a whole dynamical system that's made up of many parts and relationships between those parts. So we wanna zoom into those relationships because nature hides many or conceals many of its secrets inside the relationships. Another, the final one is P circles, perspective circles. So rather than just seeing something from your perspective, make a circle of perspectives around it to see it from different angles. Those are just a few of the moves, but... Um, you want to the, add to that? Well, I was just thinking of examples of every all of them when you were talking about yeah. it, because I was, that's what I yeah. did. Do you mind maybe just for one minute, like picking an object and, and showing yeah. us? Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? So, for example, I just talked about RDSs, right? This is my water bottle. I just talked about RDSs, which is a relationship that is also a distinction that's also a, a, a system, right? So this water bottle has some parts. It's got this long part here. And then it's got this top part, right? But really interestingly is, is that these two parts have a relationship. You can see it right there. It's the, it's the, it's the grooves, the threads on, and the female and male threads on the, on the two sides, right? And now we see that, that that's actually kind of a, a complex little system of threads that goes together, right? So it's a whole part, whole system. And you can imagine if you're a designer, of, you know, say your whole world was designing threads, you would understand like how thick those need to be and how far apart they need to be. And, you know, all the tolerances and, you know, you would realize, wow, that's a really actually a very complex little relationship between these two things. And that's, that's just that's everywhere you look, right? Here's another two parts. And this has a relationship, which is just simply based on friction and, and a, you know, male, female part, right? Every single part, this this whole piece has parts to it that are related. And every one of those relationships is a, a system. So DSRP is just telling you that as you distinguish parts, you see the relationships between the different parts and each other. And then you zoom into those relationships and you see those as systems itself that are related. And you look at that whole system from different perspectives. For example, we did a study actually similar to this which is, well, this is a water bottle. We made a distinction. It's a water bottle. But if somebody attacked me right now, I suddenly wouldn't see this as a water bottle. I might see it as a weapon because it's heavy and, and it's hard, right? So the distinctions we make and the relationships and the part whole systems will change when we change the perspective and we see something completely different. Just to move it just two seconds beyond water bottles. <laughs> so an RDS, for example, a relationship that is distinguished, which means it's named or labeled, and then systematized, meaning we look at it at its part level. You think about biology and chemistry, biochemistry, right? Biochemistry is an RDS. It's an entire field of study that is relating to things. You think about in the US, we used to have gas stations and we used to have mini marts, right? Little places you could stop and get snacks. Well, somebody who's made a lot of money now has combined those to become these convenience stops, right? So they took the gas station, they took the mini mart, the little grocery store, and now they have these convenience stops. And those you can RDSs. imagine that's an RDS. So what, what I think is important to get across is from everyday objects to entire fields, all kinds of things are existing in an RDS. So if you know to look for them, then you'll understand things more deeply. The way you think about things will be more in alignment with how they're actually existing. That's right. So on the, that was awesome. Thank you. Like, so I guess the next question is, so what is DSRP then? Is it a method? Is it a general systems theory? What is it? Is it a tool? It's reality. 
it is, it, you can't think without thinking in DSRP. Uh, so, so again, like people think, oh, well, oh, DSRP, that's cool. Maybe I'll use it. You don't really get to choose whether you use it anymore you, than you get to choose whether you're going to be affected by gravity. Um, what you get to choose is whether you're aware of it. You're making distinctions right now. You're making groupings right now. You're making, you know, when you say bookshelf, you're behind us, you're, you're distinguishing the bookshelf from us. You're, you're seeing, you know, books is a group. A book is a definition, a, a thing, but a book is also a part whole system, isn't it? Because it's made up of pages and binding and cover and all kinds of stuff. And the pages are made apart whole systems, et cetera. You're making relationships between things and you're for sure in your perspective, but you might be taking other perspectives. So DSRP is just a reality that you should be aware of. And the more aware you are of it, the better, and the more you practice it, the better you'll be at doing it in its full range of things at a conscious level. So just as a quick, sorry, I'm going to pull on that yeah, yeah. a little bit, yeah. that string. When we were doing this a long time ago, we would often say it's the noun and a verb, meaning DSRP is the state in which things exist. Things in the universe are distinct. They have part whole systems, their relationships. And it's also a verb, meaning it's a way that you can organize the things you're thinking about to match the way things are actually existing. So it's it's a, a state of being, and it's also a process by which you can sort of interrogate things as you're thinking about them. I would also just add one more thing, Kristen, sorry. Because <laughs> uh, I noticed in the chat, there's a lot of different things coming up about different frameworks and things like that. And that's awesome. There's a lot of great frameworks out there. There's System dynamics, soft systems methodology, VSM, CST. you know, CST, all these different things. Friedhoff Capra's work, blah blah blah. Right? DSRP is universal to all those. Meaning, you can use DSRP to do system dynamics. You can use it to do soft systems methodology. You can use it to do all those, or you can just use it to do all the things that you do in life. So it's a it, they're universal patterns that underlie all of the systems frameworks. Um, which means that you don't have to spend, you know, when I came to the discipline, I literally went around like, like that book. Uh, oh, are you my mom? Are you my mommy? And I, I was trying to figure out the discipline. So I went to the, all the great systems thinking <laughs> experts and interviewed them all over the world. And I said, you know, tell me what systems thinking is. And it, the answers were just like, wow, how place. am I ever going to understand any of this? This is crazy. There's too many things. I have to spend the rest of my life you know, learning 7,000 different methodologies in order to understand what systems thinking is. So I said, I don't, I'm not really satisfied with that answer. I think that this feels more tribal than anything else. It, what, what I wanted to discover was what are the patterns that I have to get good at in order to be a good systems thinker? And I don't care what tribe or what framework or what model, just what are the patterns that I have to be good at in order to be good at systems thinking. And that's what we need 8 billion people's 8 billion people to to do is be good at systems thinking. I don't care what where their trainings from or where you know what, what tribe they're part of or whatever. We just need them to be good at systems thinking. Yeah. So that was awesome. <laughs> Question. I'm seeing some questions around like tactical what can we do? Yeah. Today, yeah, to this in education or advance this to solve a problem yeah. that these people you know, that our guests are having in their lives. So, so here's the thing. Yeah. yeah, if you want to get started, I want you to just actually on our website. There's this thing called the Five Q Poster that you can download for free. Anything you're thinking about, ask yourself at least one of the questions that we've talked about. Mimic the basic moves. Like, what are the distinctions you're seeing or the things you're not seeing, right? How are the things I'm thinking about organized into part whole systems, right? Or could those parts be organized differently to bring out different meaning? Or ask yourself about anything like, are these related? Are they not related? Can I further understand that relationship? So it's literally just interrogating or, or questioning how you're coming to understand things with those questions. Like, what are the distinctions I'm seeing? How are things organized into systems? How are things related or not? But I think related is better. 
And are there other perspectives that I could be looking at this thing from that would give me a deeper understanding of it or a more uh, complete view of a system, right? And if you just start there and do kind of like what Christian did at the beginning, where he said, can you do it with just a regular object? Don't try to start with like healthcare or, <laughs> you know, all of education. Start practicing so that you're burning the neurons on a coffee cup or a table or, you know, whatever, or a billboard as you're driving down the highway. Uh, deconstruct what the billboard is doing or what it's trying to get you to do or whatever. And um, and just start simple. And then you can start applying it to increasingly more complex stuff. But it really is just practicing the moves. That's You, you can learn... Laura said you can download that thing for free on our website, cabrerresearch.org. Which is true. Which is true. Just go there. But right above that thing is a 12-minute video. And if you don't know what DSRP, just watch the video. It's free. Just watch it. And it'll, you, you, it'll, it'll tell you what DSRP is. And then, you, and then you'll be able to start practicing the moves. Yeah. That's the important part. I mean, even things as choosing between coffee and tea, that's a distinction you're making. If you just start to sort of see it all around you, then you'll start to be able to apply it to the, the sort of more complex things that you're thinking about. And also I would say have fun with it. Like I think part of it is just being playful with it. That's That actually is really important. I think a lot of people are like, am I doing it right? What if I do it wrong? Don't Don't worry about that. Just have fun with it. It's just like any other practice. Like if you make violin a, a death march, you're not going to end up loving the violin. You know, if you make weightlifting, you know, painful, you're not going to love it. Go in and enjoy yourself, understand, you know, feel your body, feel, feel the practice of it and have fun with it. And you'll get good at it. And, and within two weeks, if you practice, you're going to, you're going to say to yourself, wow, how did I not see all these things before? I'm, start, I'm starting to see so much more around me than I've ever seen before. Yeah. And whatever age you are, you're going to say, how did I make it to this age without seeing all these, uh, these things that, that, are, that have been around me all, all along? They're there, yeah. They're not new. They're already in you. You're already doing it. So, <clears throat> we have two directions. Um potentially I see a fork in the road and the kind of questions that we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to let you pick where yeah. you'd rather go. One is on um, success you've had in kind of selling or like convincing people that they need to learn systems thinking specifically within education. And mm -hmm. what kind of uh, things do you do to impact our education system to be able to be more open to systems thinking? So that's one potential path that we could do. Another path is like, what do you mean DSRP is universal? How does this compare to all the other frameworks and models? And isn't it reductionistic to say these things? So either do you want to stay on? <laughs> you know where he's going and yeah. where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, that's why. That's the, why the, the latter questions, I think we probably don't have enough time to get get a deeper answer in, but but I I I can assure you it's not reduction. But they're also kind but, of related, uh, the two they're things, very related. If you think about it. I think I I would I would say I don't try to convince people of anything. What I try to do is make things easier to understand but not lose fidelity and give people motivation for doing it. Like what it's what it's going to do for you, how it's going to those, those, and I, and we push the envelope on the science. Those, that's our mission, actually. Push, facilitate, motivate, and we just do that over and over and over again. We push the science. We, uh, you know, push the envelope on on the best science that we can find in systems thinking. We make things easier for people to understand without losing fidelity, and we motivate people when we can't make the learning curve any flatter. Um, and so I would just try to make it easy for folks like give them the move listen to a five-hour talk on systems thinking you know just give them a move and let them practice it and you're either going to see the results or you're not like you take rds into the world and you practice rds for one day you're going to be like wow i'm just seeing way more stuff than i saw this morning and the proof is in the pudding as my mother used to say like at the end of the day yeah, you know, the proof's in the pudding. Let them taste it. The short That's what Ben and Jerry's did. They just put the ice cream in people's mouths, right? Well, yeah, but <laughs> the other sort of short answer to the two questions is, you know, 
when when educators started to understand that teaching these types of thinking skills across topics, meaning that DSRP is sort of content agnostic, it's more about the dynamics of how we're thinking, they realized that the investment they put into teaching that, the return was far greater because it was happening across topics, across disciplines, just like DSRP is underpinning all of the sort of methodological pluralism of the field, right? DSR and P are embedded inside of SSM, SD, see all of those other frameworks. And so they actually, did you see that relationship? I yes. Think? Because exactly. I'm a systems thinker. I just related two things that seemed unrelated. Yeah. But they were totally that was related. Good. See that? That fast. That's how it happened. There you go. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think that covers most of the questions. I think there are some ones around um, using systems thinking in like people's personal lives, daily lives. I think that inspiring story really um, tugged on a heartstring or two out there in the audience. So that's good. Do you want to talk a little bit about self-help and personal, like uh, using systems thinking in your personal life? Yes. We yeah, I, I think, again, like that little that kid story that we told, I, I think that's really important is that like, when, you know, when you can, when what what DSRP for me does is it allows me to understand really complicated, complex, difficult to understand science, but it also allows me to like, have a deeper conversation with my kids and with my wife and it helps me understand my dog better, you know, like it helps me understand systems better. So it's not just a technical application. It helps me understand my own internal emotional systems better because those emotions are systems. And by the way, DSRP isn't just something that's happening in your brain. Your tongue is doing DSRP. Your ears are doing DSRP. Your, your, your senses, your muscles, all of it are doing DSRP. So um, yeah. it really applies to everything and you can use it to, to um, uh, you know, navigate your emotional state, which obviously has a huge influence on your cognitive state, which obviously has a huge influence on your motivational or conation state um, and, and which is going to affect your predictions and your decisions and your behaviors. Yeah. Um, your mental models really are not just mental, I guess is the other way of saying it. Mental model, we call them mental models and mental sounds like it's all happening up here, but it's actually happening entirely embodied. And they drive um, your behavior. And it drives your behavior. And your choices. I see Shakti's returned. Yes. Yeah. It's probably time right. to wrap I'll up. drop off, thank you. Thanks, Christian. You're muted, Shakti. Shakti, you're muted. All right. Uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Laura. Th uh, thank you, Derek. What I'm just going to do is a quick recap of uh, some of the key messages. I was taking down notes whilst uh, Derek and Laura were speaking. I'm just going to read out some of the things with, as a summary. So uh, what we, we began off by saying that, look, all of us are not, a, are not born systems thinkers, uh, but it's a skill that can be learned. So that was the, one of the things that we established quite uh, early in this webinar. And that uh, what we've seen in our academic institutions from school all the way up to university, that uh, systems thinking is a metacognition, but it has not been integrated in curricula. Yeah, pretty much across the board. And it ought to really be uh, the DNA of, uh, you know, every uh, every course or every program that is, uh, that is taught, of all our learning programs. And some of the reasons for that, and I'll mention one of the reasons you mentioned is that uh, systems thinking has been over the decades, it's been a little uh, convoluted as in it's not been accessible to, uh, you know, to everyday people. And there has also been some tribalism, but uh, I, it's very heartening to see that, uh, you know, both of you have made an attempt to come up with a unified theory for systems thinking. Uh, we also, you spoke about uh, problems. If problems are limited by boundaries, this is, uh, you know, when we're looking at uh, uh, monodisciplinary uh, uh, you know, problems, then uh, our solutions are also going to be monodisciplinary. So it really builds the case for systems thinking, builds the case for 
uh, interdisciplinary studies and you know understanding uh, interrelationships and uh, also thank you for bringing out that distinction between uh, bivalent logic and uh, multivalent logic uh, what i thought was uh, was really very profound was your your touching upon the web of causa causalities and uh, the imperative to practice systems thinking you know using the same example that you gave for learning the violin yeah you got to be to be good at systems thinking you got to be able to uh, to practice we don't have the time right now in this webinar but there's so many other things that we could have talked about about <laughs> gamification storytelling you know practicing but uh, we will keep that for another day what i also heard you saying uh, laura was that uh, for school children and particularly for you know younger school children that dsrp is something which is fairly intuitive it could be it can come in very it can be taught to school children very easily because uh, that's something that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, uh, whether we are conscious of it or not is a different thing but dsrp is happening to us on a you know on a day-to-day -day basis uh, you also mentioned that systems thinking is not about holism only it is about holism and reductionism so it's about uh looking at it's not about not the parts it's about look viewing the parts in relation to the system in relation to the whole and uh, you gave a great example of yin and yang and then uh, uh, finally to summarize you mentioned that systems thinking it can really help in bringing the right and the and the left brain faculties together it can it can mesh uh, you know uh, thinking across uh, the hemispheres both the east and the and the western hemisphere and it can can really offer all of us, not just all the people on the call today, but for all our communities, for all our, uh, you know, for all our uh, people across nations, across boundaries, a middle way, you know, and and that is something which I see really as the beauty of systems thinking. So, so thank you very much, uh, you know, uh, Laura and Derek for being with us today. Uh, I do hope. Uh, you know, we, you will do more of these webinars and I wish you all the very best. Don't forget that uh, each one of us who's been on this webinar today wants to see systems thinking become pervasive. But good luck with your, your vision of making, you know, bringing around uh, a sea change on this planet and having 8 billion uh, systems <laughs> thinkers. That is just absolutely incredible. Yeah, thank you once again to all our viewers for uh, being on this call today. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the session. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, email me. I am going to put my email in the chat box. It's shakti at shaktipai.in. And I look forward to continuing our conversation. Yeah, so, so thank you all. Yeah, bye from Mumbai. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shakti. And thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.